Joe, it's a richly valued stock market right now. How does somebody who has made his career as a low-priced stock picker, a value manager, if you will, operate? It's tough because I am looking for extreme values. I want something that's not just a little underpriced, but has a big gap between price and intrinsic value and a long runway. And to top that off, I'm supposed to stick to stocks that are under $35. So most of those com companies are international. Japan is very well represented in the, the fund. Japanese small caps, uh, also other international markets, but especially Japan. How much of a macro overlay do you use when picking foreign stocks? Uh, not very much. In, in the book that I recently wrote, Big Money, Think Small, there's chapter seven, uh, which is about macro overlays and how I blew myself up with a macro overlay. So no, other than very big picture that if Korea turns into war, that's very bad news. That's what I was thinking, big picture. So you do incorporate some of those things. You have to, we all have to. But how, how, how do you handicap that? I, I can't handicap that. Fair enough, hard to handicap. Um, what do you find the biggest challenge right now in finding and ultimately picking these low price stocks? You always have to have, to, to get a bargain, you have to think differently than the market. And it's a very picked over market. And so my frustration is retail. You know, lots of the companies will be dead meat because of Amazon but some of them will adapt and become omni-channel retailers. And sorting out the dead from the living is tough work and takes different paths than I would have expected. Have you figured it out? <laughs> no. Only if Jeff Bezos will conference call me in and tell me who's, who's going to die. <laughs> I'm not sure he knows. He's right. got his ideas about whom he wants to kill. Yep. Um, have you found any companies that you think will survive and thrive in this retail transformation underway thanks to Amazon? Uh, it's a moving target. I, I thought auto parts retailers were well protected, but the same day delivery that comes with Whole Foods could also be used in auto parts, and I thought that protected auto parts retailers. Uh, so auto parts is something that you thought about. What else have you gone through and either said, mm, maybe it's got promise, or decided that there's no future whatsoever? Changing discounters like TJ Maxx and Ross stores probably are better protected, but it's, it's hard to tell because Bezos says, your margin is my opportunity. So all of the businesses that look like great businesses to me are on his target list. So there may be some survivors, but at the moment it's almost impossible to tell. It's hard to tell. How do you participate in transformative industries or game-changing technologies like what Amazon is doing with e-commerce when so many of those stocks, to the degree that they even go public anymore, aren't low-priced? Yep, they're not low priced. They're not even publicly traded. One of the tragedies of being a small cap manager is the number of public companies has dropped in half. And I was at the meeting for America Online, which was a big thing in the 90s, and you know, met Michael Dell on the IPO. But those companies are not coming public anymore, and they're not small cap anymore, which is a great frustration for me. So can you participate in secondary or tertiary ways? That's the great frustration. It's become so much more of a winner-take-all, monopolistic, oligopolistic market in the United States. And that is a feature of today's market. This is something that you have not seen in the, what, 28 years since you started doing this in 89? It's a feature of America's economy increasingly over the last 
couple of decades that it's become more oligopolistic, more winner take all. Um, it's, it's in, in the stock market as much as it is in society. Yeah. I mean, so Amazon prospers. How do I play e-commerce in small caps? There's Wayfair, but there's also lots of carnage. There's lots of retailers that won't make it. So in the Russell 2000, which is my benchmark, there's more losers than winners. And a lot of the winners in e-commerce are private companies. And Wayfair isn't the same bet as Amazon. It certainly isn't. Is anything going to change that winner-take-all situation you observe and, and we're living in? Not that I know of. I, I think it's part of why politics is so divisive. You're not buying retail. It's hard to participate. I am, I, oh, you I, are. I, I hold retail, but with not great confidence. Ah, that, that, that's even tougher, isn't it? Yes. Yes. It's the problem with value investing is you are saying that the future is less dark than you know, people think, whereas it's great to be a growth investor and say the future is even brighter than you think. You know, the future is not only going to be good, it's going to be amazing. That, that, I, I love those kind of stocks, but what I've got are it's overcast, not a hurricane warning. So does the difficulty of value investing that you describe make you question the value of value? No. The, the whole point of the book is thinking about how you get to those estimates of value. And part of it is about the resilience of the business. And you know, I, I think it's still a valid approach. So when and why does the value investor then find redemption? When the future does turn out to be less bleak than people expect, or when they luck onto something that's awesome when they thought it would be merely good. That's always been the case, I guess. Yeah. It's just harder now than it used to be. Yeah. We talked about retail, as you said, buying and holding, but not with a great deal of confidence. What else are you buying? Lots of Japanese small caps. That's the best place to prospect right now. Yeah, it's, it is fantastic. There are about as many small cap companies in Japan as in the United States with 40% of the population because in Japan, it's prestigious to be publicly listed, whereas you know, everybody wants to be in the private placement unicorn market now. We talked about the challenges of value investing. We haven't talked about the challenge that confronts all active managers, yep. which is the passive revolution. How are you thinking about it? I think the active investors add value to their investors in five ways. They bring the right attitude. They try to invest for the long term rather than gambling. They you know, know what they own and the limits of knowledge. And they avoid crooks and idiots in management. They look for resilient businesses and they don't pay too much. And the passive revolution says, I will take a little slice of all of that. I, if, if you day trade the S&P, it, it's, it's gambling. If you, you know, and a lot of the activity in ETFs is, is just that. If it's you, gambling. Yeah, if, if, you're, if you're day trading it, it's gambling. What if you're just buying and holding it? What if you just want beta? That's then, then, then what you're taking is a slice of 
ignorance. You're saying, I don't really know that much about these biotech companies, but I'll take a market weighting in that. There are crooks and idiots out there in management, and I'll take a slice of that. There are businesses that are going to get crushed, and I'll take a slice of that. The market might be fully valued, but I'll take a slice of that. So that's a criticism I've heard in part, but not expressed just the way you've expressed it. There are other critics of passive vehicles, among them Seth Klarman from Baupost, for example, Paul Singer, uh, Jason Carp from Tubion Capital. These people have looked at ETFs and passive vehicles and described them as anything from weapons of mass destruction you know, to products that are devouring capitalism to instruments that make the market less efficient. Would you agree with any of those assessments? I do think that they make the market less efficient in that you don't have people critiquing management quality. You don't have people knowing the limits of what they know. You don't have people thinking about what value is. But I also think the an index fund is a very sensible investment for people who just aren't that into stocks and investing. But who need to find a way yeah, who, who need to participate somehow. I, I think it's a very reasonable thing for many people to do. But, but I do think it makes the market more inefficient because people aren't doing the things that good active managers do. When you describe the market as being less efficient, how do you see that? How do you experience it as a money manager? What's changed? What's different? What's not as good? I think there are group moves. There, last year, there were many small cap utilities trading at PEs of 20, over 20. And they're never going to grow more than a couple percent a year. Their sole attraction is the yield. If, if you're going to pay a high multiple, you might as well get some growth and buy Google. Is there less price discovery or is it harder? I, I think there is less price discovery or there's more group price discovery, factor price discovery. But people don't know what's behind the factors, which makes it more and less efficient. I've heard passive vehicles described as a problem specific to small and mid cap stocks. And it kind of goes like this. The small cap or mid cap stocks that aren't part of large passive vehicles increasingly become orphaned by moves in the market. And they never catch up. That underperformance becomes chronic. Do you, have you seen that? Do you experience that with your stocks? Yes, or if people sack their active manager and move to passive, the net effect is they buy everything on balance that the active manager didn't own. And so those stocks outperform, which can be frustrating when loss-making companies of all types or companies where we thought management was subpar outperform. Given what you've said, all the same, should Fidelity have arrived to the ETF party a bit earlier? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think we probably should have embraced indexing a bit earlier. But uh, Why do you think the firm was reluctant? Because we have such a great heritage in active management. Because we have fund managers like Peter Lynch or Will Danoff who... Or yourself. Thanks. Uh, who have done very well. You don't love bots. But would you consider, if someone asked, designing a low-priced stock ETF? I'd be interested in an artificial intelligence project, but I'm not so interested in a ETF. I, I don't think the, a formula-driven approach would, would add value, but, but if, if you had an artificial intelligence way of telling me about management and telling me about business resilience, that would be fascinating.
Are you experimenting with it yet? Uh, there's a small project on AI uh, fidelity, but you know, there's nothing to report there. Now, when you say small, is it something that you'd like to see bigger and you'd like to become part of, if possible? Uh, we'll see what the future brings. Are you employing technology to get better results in what you do in any other way? Not in any way that I can talk about. Let me ask you about fees. I checked, and the expense ratio in your fund right now is 0.88%. Yep. How does that compare to where it used to be, say, 5, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? The expense ratio includes a performance fee. Um, our fee will go up when the fund outperforms and will go down when it underperforms. And so fluctuations in the fee will depend on how the fund is performing. The, uh, so let's take out the performance fee. It's been relatively stable. Where do you see it in five years? Probably lower since clients are moving towards lower fee funds. Do you feel pressure to cut costs? Yeah, I think, I think you always have to be efficient. How do you experience it and how do you respond? That's more in other parts of Fidelity. Making the analysts work harder, making the portfolio managers work harder. And do you feel as though the redemptions you experience in your fund are more the result of fees, performance, or the shift to passives, or perhaps something else? Probably a bit of all of them, but a great deal of them is the shift to passive, especially among institutional and corporate clients. Fidelity has always been big on internal research. Yes. But you're a consumer of Wall Street research the way most active managers are. Yep. How would you describe the quality of Wall Street research today? It's been a tough way to make a living. The number of research boutiques has gone down. Uh, the number of companies to fall has follow has gone down. So uh, that It's may... always been hard to get small cap research to begin with. Yep. Although there are some small cap boutiques and, and I find them very helpful. There's a transformation in the research business underway in Europe thanks to this new directive Mifid. called MIFID II. Do you think it's going to come here and what impact is it going to have on the kind of research you consume? The question is whether Fidelity can replicate the research internally for a lower cost whatever it makes us consider what's what's the lowest cost way of providing it if can you do it I we, there's, there's no decisions it, it's above my pay grade actually <laughs> um, do you find the work that fidelity is doing internally the research fidelity is doing on its own as good or better than it's ever been I think it's fantastic we have in Japan, a great small cap team, some great researchers there who cover stocks that even the Japanese brokers don't, don't really follow very well. It's been almost, you know, it's been since 1989 that you've been at that firm. Yeah. What's it like there today relative to what it was like back then or over the course of your career? It's bigger. Peter Lynch is retired, so, and he was fantastic for Fidelity. Uh, I think it's still a place that stresses accountability and performance. And if you look back over the course of those 28 years, and you think about the work that you do and the market in which you participate, or markets in which you participate, what's most surprisingly the same what has endured, perhaps despite your best guess or expectations? The role of human emotions, that people get overly enthusiastic about things that are going well today, and people get too pessimistic about things that are going badly today. 
human behavior doesn't change. And what's most different? The speed at which information disseminates, a would call in the 80s, it would call companies and ask them to read the line items on their earnings releases because they didn't have a fax machine at the company. And today, you can be in Wyoming in the middle of nowhere and you can get an instantaneous email with all the numbers. Now, is the speed at which information is disseminated something to embrace or something to be frightened of? It's a good thing in the it's more efficient, but it also can distract you from what's enduring value just, just because it is so accessible that you're thinking about how is the latest quarter rather than where's this company going to be in five years? Joe, thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. My pleasure. I really enjoyed that. Thank you.